Kashmir is a professor at the, the University of Florida. He's a professor of geology. He uses magnetic dating and his magnetic personality to examine how the continents have shifted over time. He has traveled around the world and is one of the few geologists who have the honor of being arrested in Kyrgyzstan. He recently published a paper on the formation of Gondwana, which to me kind of sounds like a VH1 behind the music scene. Every time I hear Pangea breaks up, I kind of think of MTV caravans going their separate ways to create differences. He's a fascinating individual who I consider myself lucky to be able to have time to have personal conversations for. And he's going to blow your socks off, especially with the interesting physical thing that he has behind the podium. And I can see it, and you can't. For the moment, ladies and gentlemen, let's all have a big hand for Joseph here. share a little bit about geology, which Darwin was fascinated with, as he was a contemporary of Charles Lyell, who was the father of modern geology. And so Darwin has lots of interest in geology, but more so his interest in biogeography and what I'm going to talk about a little bit today, paleogeography, and looking at how continents in the past have affected life and what the continents look like in the past and how we do that. And I'm going to address two issues today that Darwin had a lot of trouble with. The first one is the age of the Earth. That's a problem we've solved. The second one has to do with what happened towards the end of the Precambrian. You may have heard it called the Precambrian Explosion. There's some mystery as to how in 10 to 15 million years, basically every ancestor to every modern organism came into the fossil record, or is observed in the fossil record. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. I also want to start off with telling you about a couple of hobbies of mine. And the first hobby is taking pictures of signs around the world. So I'm going to show you a, a few of these. One of the things I like to do after a busy day in the field is go have a nice cold beer. So when I was in India, I wondered what this sign meant. <laughs> And I'll, I'll show you the next two, and you can just read them. So is that a tiger park? And this one, I'm not quite sure what it means. All right. Indians have also developed a, a real talent for competitive advertisement. So here are some signs of some airline companies in India. The first one says, quite proudly, we've changed. Not to be outdone, Kingfisher Airlines says, we made them change. <laughs> and not to be outdone, we've not changed. We're still the smartest way to fly. I also happen to be a neighbor of one Terry Jones. Does anyone recognize that name? Yes. He uh, blocks my neighborhood occasionally with his antics. One of the other things that I've collected around uh, the United States are signs from churches. So here are some signs I found from churches. <laughs> uh, my favorite one there is uh, if your faith is big enough, facts don't count. All right, so one of, my, one of the things I want to let you know is that all the, most all of the pictures in the background of these slides are from my travels around the world, and I feel a certain kinship with Darwin, who also got to travel around the world. He did it a little slower than I did, um, but it's still fascinating to be able to visit all these different locations. This is uh, Lake Pustagul near the Russian-Mongolian border. This is a very deep, freshwater rift lake uh, when... Uh, Basically, Asia is trying to, to break apart. So what's the point? Why, do, why should we care about the science of paleogeography? Well, it turns out there are practical reasons. Uh, for example, petroleum, which we need, uh, although we might want to train ourselves to get off of it, 
Petroleum forms in specific environments and require a source rock, a seal, and a reservoir rock. And those occur in certain locations, and there are certain favorable locations to find all of those together. Economic minerals such as gold, silver, and platinum form in specific tectonic settings. And so if we know what the tectonic settings were in the past, we can maybe, it, it aids in our exploration for these minerals. We also know that evolution can be driven by a number of things, both intrinsic biological factors and extrinsic factors. And evolution in particular, we think, can be driven by changes in continental separation or joining continents. Basically, you're introducing new species onto land masses that previously weren't connected, or you're dispersing them apart. You're breaking them apart, and you're isolating species. And Charles Darwin knew this very well. And we also know that climate change is driven, at least in part, by continental configuration. Um, so a quick outline of my talk. The first thing I'm going to do is just give you a quick look at supercontinents through time. I'm going to show you basically the supercontinents that we think have existed in the past and, and what they look like. And then I'm going to go through what's in our toolbox. How do we establish past, how do we establish past continental configurations? And then we'll go to Colombia, the oldest supercontinent, which formed about 2 billion years ago and lasted to about 1.5 billion years ago. It's a fascinating time in Earth history that doesn't get quite the attention that it should. And I'll talk about why it should get a little more attention. We also don't know a lot about it. But we do know some key events that probably played a role in the evolutionary, the gradual evolutionary history of life on Earth took place during that time period. And then we'll take a look at what I think is probably, for me personally, the most fascinating interval of Earth history. And it takes place in the Neoproterozoic to the early Cambrian when a supercontinent called Rodinia formed, and the Earth went through a series of very, very severe climate change. Climate change like we've never seen since, and we never probably will see again. And it's called the Snowball Earth. And perhaps this was a bottleneck and flush episode, prelude to the Cambrian explosion. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And then the breakup of Rodinia and the Cambrian explosion is what I will conclude with. All right, so when we think about supercontinents, this is basically a period in Earth history when 75% or more of the extent, the present crust, is assembled into one large landmass. And believe it or not, uh, this was known in part, this was hypothesized by looking at ages, uranium lead zircon ages, uh, just a histogram of these through time in 1962 by Runcorn. It's been updated in 2010. It really hasn't changed all that much. And you can see that there are a number of supercontinents. Slavia Superior, which is still a, a bit in debate. Colombia, the oldest supercontinent. Rodinia, Gondwana, Pangaea. And of course, that sort of hints that there might be a supercontinent in the future. So I'm just going to show you pictures of these. This is what Colombia may have looked like. This is right before its breakup at about one and a half billion years ago. It was followed by Rodinia, and I'll show you here. That if you're looking for North America, North America tends to be in the center of these uh, two supercontinents. Here's Laurentia here. Florida had not yet formed. Florida was a latecomer to the Earth. It, it formed at about 700 million years ago. Uh, and then that was followed by Gondwana, which is an assembly of the southern continents, shown here. You can see India, Africa, South America, Antarctica, and Australia, along with Madagascar and Sri Lanka down here. And then the one that most people are familiar with, Pangaea, which formed at about 300 million years and lasted to about 260 million years. And you can actually look down in here, sandwiched between Africa and South America is Florida. And Florida was left behind when Pangaea broke apart. So Florida was once part of Africa and now has been donated to North America, and so we have a place to live. 